So my name is Frances, and as Dr. Armstrong said, I'm the clinical case manager at the Center for Movement Disorders. I've been with the center for about three years, yeah, three years now in June. And during that time, I've met with several different patients and their families, each with their own unique set of needs and concerns. But I've noticed that regardless of factors like age, location, or even diagnosis, there's a few questions that I get asked almost every time I meet with someone. And so my goal for today is to answer some of those frequently asked questions and hopefully it will help guide you as you continue to make decisions about you or your loved one's health care. So as a person's condition progresses, they might find that it's getting a little bit harder to carry out tasks just in their daily life. Or maybe as the caregiver you're finding it's um, hard for you to carry out your caregiving duties because of your own limitations, or maybe you just need a break from your caregiving duties, which is completely normal. And so those are just some of the reasons why somebody might ask me the question, how can I get help at home? Um, but before we talk about how to get that help, I do want to talk about the types of help that you can get at home. So there's two main types of in-home care. The first is medical, which is partly what Lisa was talking about earlier. So you can get um, home health, which includes skilled nursing for things like wound care or IV infusions. Um, you can get therapy, so physical, occupational, and speech therapy. You can get medical social services, which is like what I do, but somebody coming into the home to talk to you about resources or care options. And then you can also get a home health aid in home. There's a star next to that one because there's something I want to mention later on, um, so we'll get back to that. And then the other kind of care is non-medical, so that's basically assistance with um, just daily activities like bathing, getting dressed, meal prep, reminding you to take your medications, so things that don't require any kind of skilled or medical intervention. So before I go over um, some coverage, uh, insurance coverage information. I do want to say that everyone's insurance benefits are different. And so I'm just going to go over some of the common ones that I encounter in clinic. Um, but if you have more specific questions about your insurance, I can meet with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about it. Um, so these are the things that are not covered by Medicare, the services that are not covered. So that includes 24-7 care, meals delivered to your home, homemaker services, and personal care. So, like I said on my last slide, I put a little star next to home health aid because a home health aid does help with personal care needs. And it would be covered by Medicare, but the caveat to that is that it has to be in conjunction with one of the other medical services I talked about, like therapy or nursing. So if it is the only help that you need, the only thing that you need is assistance with bathing and dressing, unfortunately, we can't order that on its own because it's not a skilled service, according to Medicare. Um, so an aid alone, not covered by Medicare. So if we are referencing the chart from before, the left ones, medical, are covered. Right ones, not medical, not covered. So what happens if you're looking for non-medical care, your Medicare doesn't cover it, what are your options? So there's a few options available to families who are looking to cover non-medical home care. The first and obviously most straightforward is to just pay out of pocket. And so you could do that through like an agency or hiring someone privately. Um, in my opinion, it's most convenient to go through an agency because they take care of things like um, background checks and making sure everyone's up to date on their licenses and training. Um, but that being said, on average, hiring an aid through an agency is probably going to cost you about $18 an hour. Um, which is why some families decide to go the private route because there tends to be more flexibility with um, pay or cost when you're working one-on-one -on -one with someone. Another option is to, do, to use your long-term health care policy. And this is a policy that people typically get ahead of time prior to their diagnosis. They might have gotten it maybe through their previous employer or maybe they just bought it um, privately on their own. And it's used to, care, uh, to cover some of your long-term care needs, which includes non-medical home care. Um, each of these policies is very different. Um, some have unlimited benefits, some have a limit on the duration or type of services that you can use them for. So if a family or a person is trying to use their long-term health care policy for medical, non-medical home care, I like to meet with them first before initiating benefits so we can really discuss um, what would be the best way to use them. And I can also help with filing the paperwork to initiate those benefits. 
Then you can use your VA benefits, obviously, if you're a veteran. Um, the VA does cover some non-medical home care through aid in attendance. Um, the best way to determine if you are eligible for your VA benefits is to go through your local veteran services office. And that's an office that's just dedicated to helping veterans and their dependents apply for and see if they're eligible for any kind of assistance or, or benefits for in-home home care, amongst other things. Um, there are limits on what the VA will cover, and sometimes there's a copay as well, and that's based on your service-connected disability status and your financial information. Another option is to apply through senior services. So there are agencies in each county whose purpose is to provide services to seniors into the, in the community. They are able to provide subsidized cost services through various initiatives like community care for the elderly, home care for the elderly, and the Alzheimer's disease initiative. So these provide lower cost services um, for seniors in the community. Typically, there are wait lists for these programs, so I always advise uh, patients and families to get on the wait list as soon as possible because it's better to be on the wait list and not need it than need it and not be on the wait list. And people are taken off the wait list based on avail availability of funding. The last is long-term care Medicaid, and that's a special kind of waiver that's offered through the state um, for individuals who need long-term care services but aren't able to afford it. So it can help cover non-medical home care among, as well as other uh, long-term care services that we'll talk about. Eligibility for long-term care Medicaid is based on a few different factors like age, uh, level of need, and uh, financial status as well. So the way that you can determine if you are eligible for long-term care Medicaid is to contact your local elder helpline. And so if you're from Gainesville or Alachua County, you're, or any of these counties listed here, it's a, quite a few, um, your elder helpline number is on the slide, 1-800-963-5337. They're the ones who help manage the wait list for long-term care Medicaid. Um, if you're not one of these counties, each county has a, an elder helpline. The list of all of them can be found on the Department of Elder Affairs, or I can help you find it as well, obviously. So what happens if you need, in -home, you need assistance for your loved one, but you're not able to afford in-home care or you're on these wait lists and you're just kind of waiting it out? Something to consider as an alternative is an adult daycare center. So an adult daycare center is a facility that provides respite to caregivers while ensuring that their loved one is in a safe and secure environment. So when someone is at an adult daycare center, they're supervised, they're engaged in activities, they have somebody attending to their medical needs, and they get the added benefit of socialization, which is not always something they can get if just one person is coming into the home and dealing with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, one of the benefits of going through an adult daycare center is that typically it's a fraction of the cost of hiring somebody in home. So an eight hour day at an ADC, on average in the state of Florida, runs about $65 a day. So that's eight hours and it usually includes meals, so like a breakfast and a snack or something like that. So you really get a lot for your money. Um, if you compare that to hiring somebody in home at $18 an hour for an eight hour day, that's about $150. So you can see it not only benefits the caregiver and the person going, but it really benefits all of your wallets as well. So if you are from Gainesville, uh, we actually have two adult daycare centers in the city. We have Al's Place and Altrusa House. If you're not from Gainesville, we can easily find out if you have an adult daycare center near, near you. There's an online listing of all the ones licensed in the state of Florida, so I can help you get that information as well. So there's a few reasons why um, someone might be looking into assisted living. Um, maybe they're finding that it's getting harder to maintain their own home or it's just not accessible anymore. Or maybe as the caregiver, you live far away and you would feel more comfortable if your loved one was in a secure environment where you know their needs are getting attended to. Um, so when someone does decide that this is the next step for them or their family member and they meet with me to discuss their options, not just what is available, but they also want to know how do we cover the cost of an assisted living? Will their insurance cover it? And so the answer to that is it depends. It depends on your type of insurance. And um, like I said before, there's lots of different kinds of insurance policies. I'm just going to go over the ones that I encounter mo most often in clinic. 
So the first one is Medicare, and unfortunately Medicare does not cover an assisted living facility. They might cover some qualified health care costs while you're at the facility, but the intention of Medicare is not to provide long-term care, uh, mostly just short-term care in like a rehab or skilled nursing facility. Long-term care Medicaid is that waiver program we talked about before for individuals who need the services but aren't able to afford it. And so if you are enrolled in this program, not only can you use it for in-home care, you can also use it to help cover some of the costs of an assisted living facility. Um, without getting too much into it, it won't cover all of the costs of the facilities. So assisted living facility fees are kind of broken down into two parts. You have the room and board fee, which is basically just rent to live there. And then you have the level of care fee, which is based on how much assistance you need. So the Medicaid will cover the care part, but it won't cover the room and board. So even if you plan on using Medicaid to cover an assisted living facility, just know that part of the cost will still be your responsibility. Another thing to keep in mind is that this waiver functions just like any other insurance. So you're gonna to need to work with the facility that is contracted with your Medicaid provider. For those of you who have benefits through the VA, um, they actually function similar to the long-term care Medicaid in that they won't cover the rent or room and board, but they will help cover some of the care costs while you're in the facility. And the best way, again, to determine if you're eligible for any kind of assistance would be to go through your local VSO office to determine eligibility. If you or your loved one is a veteran and looking for an assisted living facility, you might be curious to know about the Robert H. Jenkins Jr. Veterans Home. It's located in Lake City and it's an assisted living facility that is dedicated to just serving the veteran population. So you kind of have a special place just for you. Last is long-term care insurance, and these are the policies that we talked about before that people might get privately or through their previous employer to cover their long-term care needs. Um, these can be used to cover assisted living facilities. Every policy is different, so some might cover a lot more benefits or over a lot more time. So that, if you plan on using that type of coverage, I always, again, recommend talking to a social worker, whether it's me or another one nearby, um, to determine what would be the best way to maximize your benefits because we don't want to use them all up front. We want to make sure we're using them wisely over time as, so that as the needs progress, we don't run out of services essentially too quickly. So all of that being said, ultimately, most often people just pay out of pocket for assisted living facilities, but there are alternatives available, obviously. So people with conditions like the atypical Parkinson's, PSP, MSA, CBD, or Lewy body dementia have unique needs, obviously, and they require specialized care. We're very fortunate in our clinic to be able to provide that specialized care through our expert neurologists like Dr. Armstrong and our experienced staff like Lisa. Um, but what happens once you leave the clinic? Are there other facilities or programs that specialize in caring for people with Parkinson's or Parkinsonisms? And so while there's several facilities that specialize in uh, working with patients with either dementia or memory care or, or memory disorders, um, there aren't as many options for people with Parkinson's or Parkinsonisms, but these are two examples of programs that I've been able to find. The first is a Parkinson's program at a local assisted living facility. I didn't put the name on there because I wasn't sure if I would be allowed to. So if you're curious for the name, just, just let me know afterwards. But they're an ALF near Tampa that has a three-tier um, approach to their Parkinson's program that focuses on education, exercise, and wellness. And so they achieve these goals basically by providing specialized programs like uh, support group meetings, rock steady boxing, which you might be familiar with for people with Parkinson's, and they also ensure all of their staff is uh, trained in meeting the needs of the Parkinson's population. The other program is through Senior Helpers, which is an in-home care agency, and their training program was actually created in conjunction with the Parkinson's Foundation. Um, and they, it was designed to provide professional caregivers with the education needed to create appropriate care plans for people with Parkinson's or Parkinsonisms, and then to be able to carry out those care plans for them, so to best assist them. That being said, 
It's not always about finding a specialized facility or one with a special title. I will say that, that it's more so about finding a facility that is willing or open to learning about your loved one's condition. So whether they have a special you know, check mark by their name or not, um, if they're willing to not just collaborate with us, but really all of your loved one's providers to learn about their particular needs, that is probably what's most important. When is the right time for hospice? So that's obviously a very tough question, but as a case manager or a social worker, I'm always gonna be pro talking about it as soon as possible. Now, in my opinion, is always the best time to at least learn about the options that are available through hospice care. I know it's difficult to think about losing a loved one, but, and for that reason, maybe we might delay having these end of life care planning discussions. Um, but honestly, in ultimately, with the families that I've spoken to, they actually said that they wish they had started those conversations sooner and wish they had enrolled their loved one in hospice sooner just because of the level of support they received from the care team once they were, um, once they were admitted. And so although there's you know, Medicare and Florida guidelines for what the appropriate time is to refer someone to hospice, it really is a personal decision but hopefully it's been an ongoing conversation. Uh, it's easy to delay these uncomfortable conversations, but by having them in advance, it allows not only the patient to make educated decisions about what they want, it allows the family to give their input and be a part of the process. Everyone's on the same page, and so if and when the time comes for hospice, it can greatly reduce everyone's stress. If you're unsure if it's the right move for you or your loved one, just ask your physician. They are experts and they work with this population day in and day out, so they know the signs to look for when it might be time to start these kinds of services. On the other side of that, if you feel like it's time for hospice but your physician hasn't said anything, it's okay for you to speak up too. They might only see them once every six months or once a year, but you're living with them 24 seven, so you know the challenges that you're encountering. So it's important to communicate those things to your physician so that we can ensure we're providing appropriate and timely care. I spent a lot of my previous part of this presentation telling you what's not covered by Medicare, so I'm very happy to tell you that this is covered by Medicare and Medicaid. They never want cost to be a reason for not initiating services through hospice. And even if you don't have insurance, more often than not, hospice will find a way to get you the services that you need. So if I meet with a family and you know we've talked about hospice as an option, but they still don't feel like it's the right time for them, um, but we're noticing that they still need that kind of extra support, we might refer them to a transitions program. And so a transitions program is basically for people who are dealing with an advanced or chronic illness and need support but aren't enrolled in hospice just yet. So these are just examples of some of the services that you could possibly get through a transitions program. You can get supportive phone calls, volunteer visits, information about resources, education about your care options, and assistance with advanced care planning, like living wills and advanced directives. Again, all of these services are typically offered at no charge. We never want cost to be a reason to delay services. I personally know of two transitions programs that are offered um, in the nearby area. One is through Haven Hospice here in Gainesville, and the other one is through Hospice of Marion County near Ocala. So if you are looking to initiate hospice services and you want to see which providers are in your area or maybe you want to contact your local hospice to see if they offer a transitions program, you can find your local hospice or palliative care provider using the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization tool, which is on their website online. It's really great and as you can see it shows you how many are in your area. You can zoom in more obviously, but it tells you the names of the one right there. Um, and, and their contact information as well, so you can reach them. In addition, the, the NHPO website has a lot of great educational information for caregivers and families who want to learn about their options. Last but not least, where can I go to meet others who are also dealing with my diagnosis? So there's a lot of great resources out there for people with Parkinson's, but what about those who are dealing with PSP, CBD, MSA, or these other unique conditions that are a little bit different? Fortunately, there are resources out there for you. I'm gonna go over a few of them. Um, some of them you'll find that they offer similar services, but there are a few specialized programs that I'll go over as well. So the first is Cure PSP, who I guess has donated some really great shirts and stuff today, so thank you Cure PSP. 
And they actually have a misleading name because not only do they provide uh, services for individuals with PSB, they also help those with CBD, MSA, and other related diseases. Um, they have support groups in various modalities for each of these conditions, including in-person, online, and peer supporters that you can contact. They put together educational conferences just like the one we're putting together today. And they also have a search tool that allows you to find specialists in your area that are familiar with your condition. My favorite program that they have is the Quality of Life Fund, and that's actually a grant that provides respite care to families affected with any of these diagnoses. Um, and so this is a unique program because not very many organizations provide direct assistance to families, even though it's very much a need. Um, so this is something that you can apply for, and they'll actually give you financial assistance to help cover some costs of in-home care. So if you're curious to learn more about the Quality of Life Fund or really any of the organizations that I'm going to talk about, I put the website and contact information on the slides up there for each one. The other organization is the MSA Coalition, and they are focused more, more so on providing assistance to those affected by multiple system atrophy. Um, so they also have an online listing of on in-person support groups throughout the U.S., not just Florida. They also put together conferences like this one. And one program that's unique to them is they have a free support line that is staffed by former MSA caregivers. So it gives families the opportunity to talk to um, an experienced caregiver who is familiar with the diagnosis and has gone through some, a similar journey as them. The Lewy Body Dementia Association is dedicated to assisting those with Lewy Body Dementia and their families. Similar to the other organizations, they also have in-person and online support groups and online discussion groups. They have their Lewy Buddies program, which is kind of like the MSA program where they connect um, families with experienced LBD caregivers to provide emotional support, but also inform them about the programs available to them through the LBDA. If you're somebody who likes watching webinars, they have LBDA TV, which is a series of online educational presentations on various topics pertaining to Lewy body dementia. And they also have a newsletter called the Lewy Digest. So one of my favorite things about the LBDA is that they have something for everyone, whether you like to read or you wanna to talk to somebody in person um, or you wanna watch a video online, there's a modality or something that you can use. And as Dr. Armstrong said before, although we currently don't offer a support group specifically for people with an atypical Parkinson's diagnosis, we do have a, a support group for people with Parkinson's in general. And it is open to anyone affected by any kind of PD as well as caregivers. It is co-facilitated by myself and Amanda who put together this lovely event. We meet on the third Friday of the month at the center from 1230 to two. Um, we usually try to have a speaker or somebody come in to talk about something that's important to you guys. And then we split off uh, with people with Parkinson's or Parkinsonisms and then the caregivers separately, which gives each person uh, in the unit some time to talk about what's important to them. So we look forward to seeing you at our next March support group. Um, but if not, hopefully we'll have a support group for you guys specifically soon. And I put questions there, but I realize now that we're doing questions later, so just thank you. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Question. Yeah. I just wanted to add that a lot of the assisted living facilities, in addition to the local adult daycare, assisted living facilities often have day programs. So it's less expensive than hiring a caregiver. And, you know, whether it's in a memory care unit or in a regular assisted living facility, Yes, that's, that is correct. Some of the assisted livings do offer short-term respite or even overnight respite that you can use as well within the assisted living facility. Thank you.